Game loaded. Hello, everybody, to a, a different type of stream. Um, we're going to be diving into Strongholds and Followers. It's a, a book by Matt Colville and his company, NCM. It is a product, um, as you can see, MCDM. I say NCM. Uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome, welcome. Um, we're going to be talking about the book, what I've seen. This is the PDF version. The hard bow hasn't come out yet. Um, so I'm going to give my ideas of the book so far, the parts I like, parts I don't like, etc. Who this book might be for, etc. Uh, this is the first time I've done this for a book. So if you have any types and ideas, you can put them in the chat and go like, yeah, I think I like that. I like to see that. So um, we begin um, with the introduction. By the way, the art, let's start with the art, actually. Let's start with the art. The art is... I like the art. The art is very medieval. Uh, it's many books, especially since third edition, but even before, go to this sort of alternate um, fantasy world, and they kind of forget the the you know the basis of this. If the music is too loud or it bothers you, we can just shut it off. No problem. Just just let me know, chat. Uh, so. Um, So this art is very medieval, late medieval. It, it, it feels like it, it, you know, it looks like a book. So let's read the introduction um, to get an idea of what this book is all about. Uh, once upon a time, in the demon days of the hobby known as, as the 1970s, the game assumed you played until you were about the 7th level and then built a stronghold. There were no rules for this, nor was any reason given for why the player or the character might want to do such a thing. For those original players, building a stronghold was a self-evident good. It was just neat, and they assumed it would be obvious that you want to do such a thing. It meant your character was now interested in, this, in things besides killing ores and acquiring gold. Treasure was a means to an end. As your character grew in power, they became more concerned with the state of the world. There was political conflicts and armies and incursions from other dimensions, and a single fighter with a sword, even a nice, very nice sword, with own personality and special purpose, was not enough. You needed an army... Or new spells or extra panel allies. So right off the bat, uh, Mr. Colville basically saying, okay, the idea of creating a stronghold as part of Dungeons and Dragons, it's an old one. It's a well-established idea. And these rules are just going to do that essentially for 5th edition, right? But something's been there before. And, they, and many of these books, supplements have been done before, so it's not nothing new. Um... The game, I continue, the game transition from local problems to national problems to global problems. Eventually, your self, seventh level character fought a few wars or invented a spell or two and then retired, typically around 13th level. And that was it. The game had an end. This book seeks to recreate the style of play, but in modern sense, by giving the players reasons to build strongholds, we got a lot of reasons and we get a happy, happy smiley face there. Again, that's sort of the purpose. Um, I don't know if necessarily I would play this as a retirement. And here's one of the reasons why I bought this book. I've been looking, I've been keeping an eye on this book for quite a while because I thought, hey, uh, I want to play a Pathfinder Kingmaker style, but without the overly complex Pathfinder rules, either for Kingmaker or uh, or an Axe, uh, that's Adventurers Conquer Kings type game where essentially you know classic Dungeons and Dragons you create your character you level them up and at some point as, it, as the book says uh, you transition from being just an adventurer who goes to the dungeon kills things and takes treasure to becoming more a part of the world because that's that's one of the problems I would think that it's part and partial of d and d you have these worlds, whether you create them yourself or are created for you in the form of, you know, pre-established, uh, pre-published adventure settings. World of Greyhawk, Dragonlance, World of Kryn, uh, the Forgotten Realms, you know, Aber Toril, um, Planescape, Sigil, etc. You become a quest giver. Yeah, Hurricane Hugo, Hugo, 1970. Welcome to the channel. 
Yeah, in a way you become a quest giver. That's sort of the transition. And I've been thinking about that, thinking about how you run a, a campaign where you, as you level up, you transition from being the hero into basically becoming an, an NPC in the world. If you look at the world of Greyhawk, which is one of the oldest, not the oldest necessarily, but one of the oldest classic Dungeons and Dragons setting, a lot of the original characters from the Circle of Eight and others were created, right? Uh, from the ranks of Gary Gygax's and Rob Kunt's, uh, you know, joint team. They became high-level characters and stuff like that because otherwise, essentially, you kind of continue the grind. It's like, oh, I'm level five. You are you go from bandits to orcs. At level eight, you go into, say, undead. And at level 15, you're fighting demons and, you know, ancient dragons. But you're simply doing the same thing. You go, you kill the thing. Go you, Because Dungeons & Dragons, this is what Dungeons & Dragons is. Is Theseus in the, um, in the labyrinth. You go, there's a monster in the labyrinth, i.e. dungeon. Theseus, the hero, goes in, man, uh, you know, manu goes through the labyrinth, kills the Minotaur, and comes back. And you do this over and over and over again. That's what it is. That's what Dungeons and Dragons is. It's called the dungeon in Dungeons and Dragons. You go to the dungeon, and you kill the dragon. The Minotaur, not the Minotaur. Minus, minus. So, there you have it. Uh, and this is supposed to do that. And this, this is why I, 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 I wanted to get this book and for the most part, you know, first impressions, it does look very well, but it does have some problems. It looks at what the book offers. In this book, you will find rules for four types of stronghold keeps, help you raise armies and improve your fighting ability. So that generally meant for fighters, barbarians, rangers, that sort of thing. Temples, where you summon separate allies to aid you in battle. Paladins, monks, druids, clerics. Towers, let you research new spells. Uh, warlocks, wizards, and really the only one that researches new spells is wizards, but you can also do sorcerers and warlocks as well, I suppose. New ways to channel your extra plan of power or your blood. An establishment let you collect secrets and generate cash. Now, it says four, but if you read the book, it actually has five. Well, it mentions a fifth, which is the castle. And the castle is... When you put one or more of these uh, strongholds together, now it talks about domain, D M D domain with the D M E S N E. I always, uh, um, you know, spell that wrong. The um, domain, the main, domain. Um, you attract followers, which is a rule that goes all the way back at least to sec first edition Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, last game action may take a new army. Your stronghold followers sometimes make months or seasons. This is called an extended rest. A lot of this book, also, it's one of the things I would say it has timing, right? It says, okay, you can you you get new abilities and new powers, right? But they require you to take your time. And one of the things is this is this is very important. I'm gonna read it again. This rule, you're gonna see it again, and again. L large scale actions take taken by your new army, your your stronghold or your followers, something takes months or seasons. Season being three months. Also, your new abilities eventually run out of juice, and after which you must return to your domain. I would say desme, but it's not desme, it's domain, to refresh yourself. This is called an extended rest. The idea being that every so often you have to go back to the castle. Right. Uh, so, more of these new options. The book comes with new systems, including rules for warfare, in which units soldiers clash, rules for concordance, which allows your characters to plead with their deity, or for aid, rules for creating new magic items, and rules for taking your retainers with you in combat without making. Now, here's where things can start getting interesting. GM approved. Talk to your GM to make sure the new rules are allowing their game. This book asks for a lot of GM. They they are expected to, one, run NPC followers, including complex and powerful special abilities. Two, figure out which neighbors are happy or upset with your growing power in the local area. And three, make your combat harder to compensate for your new, new combat abilities. Here is when I start diverging to from where... Um, Matt is trying to do. And you can see, if you know, you see any videos by Mike Colville, this has very strong authorial voice, right? You can almost hear him talking in front of the camera and telling you these things. I can't do a good Matt Colville Im imitation, but there you go. It says GM approved. And, and this comes from a long lineage of, essentially this is a source, but this is a called Splat Book. Back in the early to mid 80s, 
the the way RPGs were designed and sold shifted from selling a handful of core books, no more than five, between three to five. If you you know if they really wanted to go far, you can buy ten at most, which was was a lot back then, about fifteen to twenty dollars each. And what you they really sold you was adventures. Then came the splat books, books with magical items. They already existed, but they you became more 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 races, more magical items, more locations, more powers, more everything, right? And these were directed at the player, right? Oh, these are options for the player. And it came to a head in third edition where it just exploded all over the place. It's it was curtailed on the fourth edition in that there were a lot of splat books and most of them were done by Wizards of the Coast and because they didn't do OGL. A supplement madness, yes, particularly. You could spend hundreds, thousands of dollars on, on entire libraries of books. And uh, because they were directed at the players, you know, like, oh, you have a group of, say, five. Four players, four, you know, characters playing PCs and your GM or your DM. Well, the DM is only one person, but if you sell to the other four people, now you have five people who are buying your books instead of instead of one. Very important. But let's be honest. I do believe that this is basically a GM book. Strongholds, fortifications, these are major things, major aspects in the world. And a lot of the rules presume that they are giving us gifts or powers from the GM to the players. So the players may want these things, but again, GM approved. It's also an aspect of this. It's also about the conversation. Playing role-playing games is a conversation, an ongoing conversation. And as you are conversing, you know, players, GM, GM players. Remember, GMs are other types of play. They're players too. They're playing the game. They just have a different role. Um, sometimes, you know, there's some things that are, can be sticking points. Like, ah, you know, maybe we don't talk about this too much. Let's talk about alignments. But alignment doesn't see a lot of problem. Doesn't really get used in in the in the in the book. I do like the way they 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 Matt talks about this. They will reference that alignment a lot. Don't freak out. It merely employs organizational tool, a fun way of saying allied or opposed. Uh, here's a recommendation, and this is some of the very good recommendations he does. Feel free to recontextualize these references however you like. You, if you're playing a lawful neutral paladin, perhaps opposing chaos is more important or useful to you than good and evil. Maybe alignment isn't useful at all, in which case the player and the GM can agree to use allied or opposed. Alignment was originally invented as an excuse to yell at players who were backstabbing others play by inventing teams and requiring them to pick our team. If they were going to continue playing, they best not take it too seriously. It's also, this is the kind of rule that says, Exactly. That's, again, part of the conversation. And this comes back again and again. In fact, I'm going to jump to a, a thing that happens later on. There is a built-in adventure here. Which I think is it's great, but we'll go back to this. On their player engagement. And I'll read this. Player engagement. Adventure is a story of faction warfare and political maneuvering that my ultimate... They may ultimately bestow upon the PC's noble title and their own stronghold. Not all players care about this stuff. For your sake and theirs, talk to your players and get a sense of how interested they are in the campaign that involves politics, intrigue, commanding armies, and maintaining a keep or castle. As long as some of them are interested in this whole stronghold thing, you should be safe. There's still plenty of dungeon exploring and orc playing in this adventure after all. That to me, and also about this one, which is why I would say it's a GM-driven uh, thing, is that... It, I think if you're if a GM and you bring this book in, this should be part of your argument. I mean, for example, the way I would do it would be, okay, this particular campaign, my idea for this campaign is that you will at some point be working probably very early on, low level. You don't get it early on. You have to get the gold and, and the treasure and all that uh, to get a stronghold, right? And then from there, that stronghold will then generate its own adventures, defending a stronghold, taking offensives, commanding armies, that sort of thing. I want I would want to I wanted to play an adventure like that for a long time because uh, let me show you this. What does that mean? This going up is vertical power, which is straightforward, like I said, from level one to level twenty, from a plus one sword to a plus three D and D. 3rd edition, plus 5 other editions, plus 20 in 3rd edition, whatever. Uh, from 5 hit points to 100 hit points. 
from plus one to hit or two to hit to plus 20 to hit, etc. Et That's vertical power. The more you go, clack, 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 you, if you survive, character survives, you get more and more power. That's vertical. Horizontal, I'm gonna do it, the camera can see it. Horizontal power is your, your imprimatur, your, your, uh, your stamp on the world. Politics, religion, that sort of thing. And D&D &D doesn't, there's really no version of D&D &D has done that very well. Birthright, which was a campaign for second edition, tried to do that, but it was very top heavy and had one particular problem, which was the king taking the, taking the field problem. I.e., why would a, and two problems in one, why would a 15 level paladin go around and start killing goblins when he has, you know, servants to do that? He has adventures, he can contract mercenaries, etc., captain of the guard, all that, right? Why he would do that? And why would he risk getting an arrow to the knee or a crossbow to the, to the chest or get a disease or something like that, get killed, get captured? He wouldn't do that, right? On the other hand, in a world where you have 15th level paladins, why doesn't the 15th level paladin just go in and kill all the goblins in a single afternoon, right? Just, just by himself. Right? His armor class is, what, 20-something, 30-something, whatever. He can heal himself completely. He has a sword that will never miss, right? He can literally just walk in. He can absorb damage. I mean, he can literally just walk in and just spear the, the goblin king right with his sword like this, like one-handed, and just do it, right? Like, an, you know, like when you cheat in a... In a D and D game, in a in an online game, you you know put mass out all the stats and nobody can touch you, kind of like that, right? Um, so it has uh, rules, of course, for money, how much it costs. They're not very complex. I like the keep peaceful. Tells you the types of stronghold. I keep a martial stronghold for characters interested in raising armies and defending local towns. Folk, barbarian camps and pirate ships are a variation of this, which is very cool. Uh, tower, like again, arcane stronghold for doing spells, reaching and learning magic. A temple is a divine stronghold for summoning extra planet allies and learning battle magic. A druid's grove is a popular variation, an establishment, and it says the cat finally it says five. A castle combining two or more of the above in a larger complex owned by run by multiple characters, each of whom may gain the mechanical benefits thereof. Ultimately, the idea there are four kinds of strongholds some variation each is completely arbitrary. You could easily have six kinds or, which, or no types. Well, it is arbitrary, but one of the things I will tell you is that there's really no rules for castle other than castle has more than one stronghold on this roof. And I feel that while the rules that you have there... Yeah. Or simply, uh, Hurricane Hugo, integrating the characters into the world, right? You are of the world, and the world has got... The world is made for the hero characters. Let me get the, the uh, audio down there a little bit, because the music is cool, but it's... It shouldn't interrupt me. Um, but they're not part of it. So why, the, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I killed the Goblin King. And what's the impact of the Goblin King other than, hey, you got his treasure, and you did a favor... Of, for the local lord is now is there a power vacuum now because you killed the goblin king right maybe maybe not mm -hmm. but that doesn't matter for dungeons and dragons that doesn't care and many players don't care they just want to kill the next bigger thing the orc king or the white king you know the lich king the demon king right <laughs> they just want to go to the next thing right which is fine i'm saying it isn't but if you want to play something different this i think this book would do uh strongholds of fortifications uh, Temple of Con Fortification and Warfare Rules. Now, here we start getting into some of the problems I have with this book. For example, this chart. Stronghold Construction. Uh, it gives you the, the, the amount of money, right? Some of the bonuses. Size per level. Toughness per level. Which is, I think, these are the hit points that it would take, I suppose, to damage. Uh, cost per upgrade and all that. The thing about these rules is, for example, it has dice code. And you don't really get an explanation of dice, these dice codes until you go all the way down to warfare. And they're no, they don't get used, they don't get mentioned across the book for pages on end, and yet they're here. In fact, most of the warfare rules are not even in this book. 
which is a bit of a problem. And a problem that Mr. Colville is very much aware of. Let's go to, I think, one of... There's one of the... Um, uh, well, he basically says in one of the footnotes, hey... Listen, splitting rules between books is not a good idea, but we kind of had to because we have this other book called uh, Warfare Kingdoms and Warfare, and that's going to deal with all the warfare rules. If you want that book, uh, you can buy it and we'll sort of complement this one. I'll say, I'll say more about that, but keep that in mind in my final critique because I think it's very important. Now, you get... Another critique is organization. You have the breakdown of the keep, the tower, the temple, the establishment. And then you have strongholds by class. Bah, yeah, I know. Uh, here's the situation. I think while the keep, the, the strongholds have some very cool ideas, such as the barbarian camp as a stronghold. Like, okay, barbarians are... And by barbarians basically means, you know... Uh, here's an, you know, these are examples of keeps. Um, okay, he, here's uh, the, the the note I was talking about. So I'm going to read it out. It's uh, foot number number five in page 16. Provinces or rest population centers and development levels are all in kingdoms and warfare. I know it's kind of bogus, but rules here you can't use yet, but I didn't want to benefit of a barbarian camp spread over two books. Again, we'll talk about that a little later at the end of the the, the, the stream. I like the idea of the barbarian camp. I like the idea of the pirate ship as, you know, that the idea of strongholds is not simply a, a castle, right? It's a, it's a base. It's a base of operations, right? Uh, although I would say that in my campaign, the pirate ship would be more of a caravel rather than a galleon. But a campaigns are different, so there you go. But like I was saying, another in, uh, problem that I have is, in a sense, you have strongholds, description of strongholds, and then you have strongholds by class. I have to keep, you know, doing this. I apologize. Strongholds by class. If I were the one, there are some rules. There are some warfare rules. We'll get to them more. But the full-on rules are in another book. Uh, or apparently so. So you, can, you have rules that will allow you to use strongholds right now in this book. Like the, very, like the light rules. And then the more complex rules are later on. But going organization, like you have strongholds and then you have strongholds by class. Now, they divided that in two sections. I would not have done it that way. I would have, for example, say the stronghold by class and the strongholds would have been in only one big section. And here, for example, you have class features. Uh, and there's some cool things like class features, like things that a stronghold would give you. Uh, class features. Uh, funding stronghold improves your class signature feature as your new domain grants you power. Typically, these improved class features are limited number of uses based on your stronghold level, usually from 1 to 5. All this goes from 1 to 5. After which, you must take an extended rest, page 15. And we'll talk about the season. Multi class characters change one of the class features, improve any change in selection. And let's see. Okay. Um, Essentially, you get some abilities, like you get some nifty abilities for having a fortress or, you know, call it a fortress or a stronghold, which are pretty cool. They're not truly overpowered, but they're pretty good. But I would say that this stronghold by class, I would have put on the stronghold. So, for example, uh, we have the Bar Theater. Well, I would put that under uh, the establishment as an example of the establishment. I think the reason they broke it up like this was that they didn't want to pigeonhole character so if a paladin wanted to they didn't want to have a keep he wanted to have an establishment like a bar well he could have a bar or she could have a bar right there's no reason why you know or a theater or something like that doesn't there's no reason why she has to have the keep even though when we talk mechanically speaking the most of the benefits are basically going to accrue by class now here's a very interesting thing in this section of strongholds by class which is more generic, but I, I wanted to to highlight it. When to roll. 
Like the, the game, the, the book asks you for several rolls. The GM decides when the player gets to roll on the following follower chart, when you get followers, you know, when they arrive. Here are some typical times to roll. When the PC spends the money for a stronghold and starts construction. When construction of the stronghold finishes. When the PC improves, that is, you keep putting money into your stronghold and get it from level 1 to level 5. A finished stronghold. When the pestle, piece, the pestles, the PCs level up. Unlike early editions of Dungeon Dragons, there's no feat that gives you followers, and like in third edition, or a uh, a um, a level that says a level seven or a level eight or level nine. If you're a wizard, you get followers or henchmen. That that's rule doesn't exist in fifth edition, and this book doesn't create that rule. But I like the reason they say when to roll, because often, especially beginner GMs or DMs, and even players, are like, okay, when do I ask for a roll? And this is a good idea of how to do it. Right? And it tells you, you know, who should roll and all that. It's a very nice, and this is a good, uh, the art is gorgeous. This is a barbarian camp, right? Uh, again, the, like, let's go to the barbarian camp and some of the followers. Elite Light Infantry, Veteran of Medium Cavalry, a Beast Lord, a Skinwalker, which is an NP... This is very interesting because it borrows the idea of NPC classes from 3rd edition and brings it back in its own way. I like that. So these are... The followers are... They're NPCs, but they're not fully fledged characters. They're not another rogue or another fighter. They are an NPC version of a fighter with spe very specific limited abilities. Uh, a Sage, Hobgoblin Ambassador, No Ambassador... If you roll 81 to 100, roll on the special allies table, and you can get very powerful allies as well. The main effects, and I'll just give you an example. Some of them are silly, you can use them or not as you see fit. Air within the barbarian's domain is particularly refreshing, bringing good cheer with no hangovers the next day, no matter how much it is consumed. Uh, wildlife within the barbarian's domain grows especially large and fierce, migrating as the camp moves. Poisons brought into the Barbarian domain is right within the hour. No such cowardly civilized forms of death are permitted. I think that's pretty cool. And stronghold actions. And this is very important. Stronghold actions essentially are based on the rule of uh, epic actions and um, lair actions. Essentially, your stronghold is your character's lair. So they can do one of the followings. On initiative count 20, losing initiative tie. So automatic. Once you get 20, and if somebody also goes rolls and gets a 20, well, you know. Uh, whoever goes lower, I suppose, wins. Uh, the Barbarian takes a stronghold action, one of the following effects. They must be in the same hex or prov province as their stronghold and cannot use the same effect again until after short or long rest. So there's a limit to this. And the book is very big on giving you pretty cool powers, but also giving you some, some specific limits. Your issue forth a mighty yop that causes all enemies within 60 feet to become frightened until initiative round count 20 on the next round. You're, this this is actions when you are in your stronghold, which is your lair. If you're somewhere else, you sometimes can't use them. It depends on what it is, right? Uh, your rage and your, and your allies gain the benefit of your rage as long as those allies aren't wearing any heavy armor. You cast Chain Lightning with a DC equal to 8 plus your Proficiency modifier plus your Constitution modifier. You may do this even while raging, and this does not end your rage. That's right. Even though barbarians can cast spells, nature comes to their aid in their stronghold. Uh, class features improvements, you get a, basically, you don't get a new feature, you get something you already have improved, so you're better at it, right? Whenever you reduce an enemy to zero hit points, you can choose to make an additional weapon attack or move up to up to your speed. You can do this a number of times equal to your stronghold level, so level is very important, going to one to five, so if you have a level three uh, stronghold, in this case a barbarian camp, you can do that three times. You must have an extended rest, which is uh, spend a season uh, or a month or a season, one to three months, especially, uh, to refresh this ability. That depends on your GM, right? Now, there's some other cool things, and I really want to go to the Wizards Library. I think it's in here. Well, I think it's, if I go, I think, go. let's go back. I think it's. Aha, spell research. Now, 
again, one of the reasons why under the tower would be much better to have all the things under the tower in one place, so I don't have to go back and forth, right? Imagine if you have the book in your hands, you go like, oh, oh well, it's not here. Oh, uh, I gotta go back. Oh, right. I love having the books because for me it's much easier. But in PDF it's the same way, and you can mark the PDF you have away. Uh, the thing about, and this is the thing that makes having this book, uh, Hurricane Hugo say, okay, so there are rules out here that you need another book. That's a good point. But I do believe there's enough here to justify um, buying it. So I'm, I'm already giving it a thumbs up, as it were, but, and this is why. Uh, uh, core, the core books have rules for creating new spells. But they're in the back, I don't get sentences what you say. Also, a combination of play initiative, etc., etc. But here's here's a rub. Inventing a new spell from scratch sort of a pain and asking hard to balance and requires a unique combination of play and balancing, but researching an existing spell. Hmm. Taking a hair hair to four boring spell, making it do something extra and neat and, and maybe weird. Going to research laboratory, not knowing exactly what you're going to get when you come out. That's magical. Here's how it works. One of the cool things is if you have a tower and you have a wizard or another spell casting class, you, eventually you can even say a, a cleric as well, but the rules assume that that's for spell casters and not divine casters. You pick a spell and you have the rules. For example, you pick something that does like something that targeted yourself, an ally, one enemy, or by guys in the area, etc. And you do the research, and then you roll, you, you pick, roll on the on the chart, and you can get some of the following things, such as empowering. For 10 minutes, a random ability of the, the target increases to 20. Uh, invulnerable until the, tar the start, the, the turn, the target is immune to all damage. Uh, and that's, you know, it's broken down by... You are an ally, place targets allies, gloating. For 10 minutes, any target who drops an enemy to zero hit points gains a dash action or attack action. I like these. I love these. Because I can imagine being a wizard and say, okay, there's magic missile. And then there's, you know, Rastafan's flaming magic projectiles. Flaming projectiles. Right? Um... Uh, there is something about these these rules, though, where it says essentially, if you do something, you can have the one spell, and the spells can be uh, and has some interesting things. We do more research; it can only be modified by research once. A given might use only modify number of spell sequence to their tower level. Yeah, you can do that, uh, and they become. They become uh, signature spells. Um, and again, one of, not only does, it, does these rules have, a, okay, just create a tower, it also has the impetus to kind of improve your tower, right? In this case, like, just like the Barbarian Camp gives you abilities and the, the Keep gives you abilities, this also gives you abilities. For example, the Cleric has the ability, well, not the Cleric, the Temple, <coughs> has the ability to summon extra planet creatures. The more powerful... The um, the temple is the grander it is, the more high level it is, the cooler the 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 things come and, and help you out. Like you, just, you know, summon uh, demons and and angels to really help you out. You know, for a short time, but it's like, oh, there's a battle. Uh, I want an archangel on my back. Okay, let's go. Let's kick some ass, right? Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, a spell research cannot grant you access to spell levels your class does not have. Uh, no mission, no spell. Well, for example, casting the spell. Now the magic uses his own spell. Valorin's blazing gaseous form. El Elemings overwhelming hypnotic pattern. The level of final spell is one higher than the spell, the original spell. So, so in essence, if you can cast fourth level spells, you should only modify spells that are levels one to three for you. That way you can always cast them. Otherwise, oh, I have a fourth level spell. Now it's a fifth level spell because we modified. It does something extra. Yeah, but I can't cast it because, uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have the slots for it. Also has rule for future use of the spell. When you just cast the spell unless it's a new nature, you may discover the spell is perhaps not as useful, you know, so you can change it, essentially. It gives you some maps, for example, towers. It also gives you some rules for um, 
other bonuses if you make the tower specifically for a subclass of mage. That's cool. Uh, so we have these rules here. Now we go to followers. Now here in followers, these followers are supposed to be, um, and it borrows a page. No, I think this is the way I would use it, Hurricane Hugo and, and the rest of chat. The way I would use it would be to transition the players from the dungeon to the keep in the sense of the focus of the adventure changes to that or you have a new base of operations and now you're more part of the world. This is how this is what I, how I would do it. You have, in fact, there's an idea I have for a campaign, but I won't go into the boring details of the world of Greyhawk and all that. I'm not going to go into that. You have low-level characters. Say you start at level three. From the get-go, I tell to the players, and the players will have to agree to this, otherwise the campaign wouldn't work. The conversation is important. Uh, oh, hey, listen, I want I want you guys to uh, eventually to say you start the campaign by liberating a broken-down ruin that used to be an old tower or a castle or something. That's your first thing. And as you adventure, you start putting money into it. And eventually, around level 7 and 8, it becomes your castle, right? So the adventures go to do that, and they do some other things. And th th there's more to it, right? But I would, I would introduce the idea early as a part of the adventure. And then once they get the keep going, or the castle, or whatever, right? Then you have new adventures that are different to that, right? Again, warfare rules, uh, launching raids into enemy territory, right? Be it becomes that sort of Game of Thrones, more political type of approach, right? You could create a situation where that would be the end game for them and they retire and stuff like this. Like, well, I'm level 10, 11th, I have my keep, you know, I become an NPC. But here's where the fun really starts because then, although it has followers here, and the good thing we're in a follower situation, I would not use these followers the way set up here. The followers are supposed to go with you and help you out. Kind of like old D&D &D would have that. You hire henchmen. I never liked the hiring of henchmen because they end up being cannon father anyway. Henchmen and mercenaries are just, they're NPCs. They're there to die and to take hits. So, yeah. All the rules here assume that they have health levels and stuff like that. I wouldn't do that. Instead, I would make your followers the new round of heroes. Like, for example, your paladin retires in level 11th. He sets up a, a, a monastery. Well, who's the new paladins and clerics and acolytes are going to get trained? Ah, another player. And they start in new. Right? So you have a cycle. And the way I would do it, I would also do it with, uh, which is not included in these rules, by the way, a little bit of hex rolling. And this is, comes from uh, Axe, uh, Adventurer, con uh, Conquerors, Kings. That's how they do it. You know, adventurers who become the conquerors, who become the kings, who then sponsor new adventures, that cycle. And you would expand to new territories, and they would create their own uh, situations. The way I would do it is that then that basically comes the, yeah, even side quests and new shots, right? The older players become the administrators, the leaders. They would come out when there's a big threat and a new book called Kingdoms and Warfare. But the older, the newer characters are the low-level characters who follow the directions. And in many ways, you can even have them both be run by the same player. Like, in a way, it's like, oh, no, the GM now has an NPC. He can do whatever. No, no, no. It's still your paladin. But you know your paladin best. You know what they want. You know the values that they want to ins install in their acolytes and their followers. Their, you know, their squires, right? Maybe the squire is a new character. Maybe the squire is another player character. Again, part of the conversation. So it could be very cool where one player character is sort of the boss of another player character. Someone else. It could be problematic. I can see some problems with that. But on the other hand, I can see, I can see the benefit as well. Or you can say, okay, fine, it's NPC. Here, GM. Go go run it. Do the thing. Right. I would have in a situation where you're in a frontier, maybe with an evil orc empire. Hint, hint. Uh, Orcs of the Pomarch in World of Greyhawk or uh, someone else, right? So, you know, the reason why, the, you know, it's keep on the borderlands and literally you go and sec you're securing the borderlands, you're securing the marches, etc. Uh, here you have the rules for retainers, uh, lieutenants, or, you know, how to deal with them. I'm not going to go too much into them. They're, they're fine. 
They're saving throw based. They're designed to make things very easy. They're simplified and well done. And, and here you have the stat blocks like the Barbarian Returners, the Reaver, Spirit Warden, right? They're, they're NPC classes, basically. And they're one page of the, they have one thing, they don't level up and it's like that. Actually, I would also use these. I would flip them on their head. They're supposed to be followers. You can have a situation where these followers are actually the leaders, right? I don't even mean that. Okay, let's say that, let's go back to the example I was giving of... Because there are rules here for an existing ruin. It gives you a 10%. Uh, you, save, you save some money if already you find an existing ruin and, and, and build it up. Well, who gave them the, the NPCs, the, the PCs a quest? Oh, it was the a troubadour warrior or a reaver or a lord master, right? They're the ones. And they become... And if you play Kingmaker, for example, from Pathfinder, either the video game, which I played during you know earlier this year, or the actual adventure, it has very complex rules. I, one of the reasons why I would use these rules instead of those rules, because it's Pathfinder, I'm not a fan of that. I mean, I know a lot of people who love Pathfinder, it's just not my cup of tea. I would actually use the follower rules to create NPCs that are the leaders, the administrators, the you know people who actually hand up the, the, the quest givers. Oh, the lore master needs something. Uh, and there's also other NPCs as well. There's... Uh, you know, there's healers, the exorcists, the skinwalkers, uh, and there's also people who work on... There's the artisans as well, which are another set of followers. Artisans are the blacksmiths and stuff like that. And it's a really, very cool thing because each one of these artisans can give you something. Can make. There's an example of something they can make. For example, the alchemists, if you uh, can make a limited... A potion called the Eyes of the Beast, Potion of Visibility to Monsters. And there even some rules to how to how to extract. They use uh, out. Um, they use a combination of arcana and medicine. I would use a combination of arcana and survival checks. If you don't want to use medicine, right? You extract. Uh, and here's a test. For example, potion of visibility to monsters for alchemists. Arrows of monster slain for blacksmith. And there's a CR. How difficult it is to get medicine check to get the stuff from the monster. Monster of sl uh, uh, sword of monster slain. Potion of monster con control. Scroll of protection from monster. Right. A scroll of protection versus werewolf. Well, you know. And that's a scribe. These people would also be the people that populate your village or your town or whatever as it grows. And they would also give you quests as well. And would pay for the stuff they have. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I think, again, it has to be G GM driven more than anything else. Because GMs ultimately have to decide what what kind of things they uh, they they affect you or not, right? Can you? Can it always be sunny at your and your keep? Well, no. There can be intrigue as well. There could be assassination plots and all of that. Uh, so there's that, and it gives you example: the, the blacksmith, the captain, the carpenter, the farmer, uh, ambassadors, and allies. Let me give a look at the allies because the allies are really supposed to be very powerful. End up rolling a special chart based on alignment. Attack something really interesting like a black dragon or a sphinx or a stone giant. I yeah, they could do that. They could do that, but I would I would just use the ones that are in this book as an example, and just you know the thing is an NPC uh, leader would be I mean they could, but we'd be really limited. And I would say okay, basically the NPC leaders are quest givers, and they're your bosses, right? And you can run them if you agree to you know. But remember, they're also the people that are going to send you to danger, right? Uh, and you can have a situation where the NPC leader has his own agenda and your player character has another agenda. I mean, they could conflict, right? right? You can even have a situation where the players are on one level, and it can be very complicated, but I can see some players. I mean, if people play Burning Wheel, they can play, They can do this. There's no problem. Uh, they could have NPC leaders and you know fighting against each other and using the, the, the PCs as their, as their you know, no, actually, the the, the uh, NPC leaders uh, they can in fact uh, level up. Um, you have new monsters. Here's warfare, and here is where I think we get into the one of the other problems. It talks about 
size, no hit points, morale, power and toughness, attack and defense, creating your own units, battle. Uh, this is pretty thorough. It's adventures in the encounter. While the pieces are fighting the bad guys, the armies are clashing nearby, outside the castle walls, or a nearby field, or on a hill. Rule initiative, you can set up your encounter normally, run as you would any other. Um, so the, there's rules here for... Yeah, they could do that. And again, it's part of the conversation. I mean, I, I, I would expect everyone to make Google wacky, basically. Uh, Hurricane Hugo. I, that's something I would certainly expect. Because people just want to mess with, you know. Everybody has, everybody has a little bit of the weasel in them when they're playing. Uh, just a little bit, which is fun. When they become full-on weasel, weaselly players at Hugo. So this is a simple... So it has the rules of warfare. But simplified. It has new items and stuff like that. Now... This is where I think this book really shines. And I'm going to have to talk about a little bit about, again, classic Dungeons and Dragons. The Siege of Castle Ren. Now, I'm not going to go too much into this. This book has a full-on adventure in it, inside of it, which I think is something that's very rare in source books. Because usually adventures are their own publication. But... Yeah, it's very lovely art. It has, it has this, you know, you can have a half orc or an orc as a, as a leader of, of, a, of something, right? As an enemy leader. Here's the thing. Classic, like I said, classic Dungeons and Dragons adventures uh, where you got your core books, and they were between two, player handbook, monster manual, monster manual, and say, if you really wanted to buy the whole collection, about 10. If you were looking, including a campaign setting book or box set or whatever, right? The bulk of the things that you bought were adventures. Publish modules. So go modules. Because they're supposed to play it. And the originals were just simply a dungeon, like, you know, uh, you know, keep on the borderlands is a keep. And then the, the case of chaos and some explanations about, you know, who's what, notes about NPCs and all that, and that's it. Doesn't have an overarching plot other than the players raid the case of chaos and destroy the, the monsters they're in and raid and take their money and that's it. And there's a cult and all that, but that's it. There's, an, there's a, uh, a return to Keeper of the Borderlands who has a, a full story in it, but early on once. And the reason why this was, this was this way was, well, twofold. First of all, adventures were the things that you did in tournaments. Uh, employees from TSR would go to things like Dragon Con and Gen Con. They would hold a tournament people would play the 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 adventure and they have pre-made characters and then it was like oh i like this adventure can i most of the people were playing usually were gms right or players but usually gms that oh i like this adventure i'm gonna buy it so i can play with my 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 party back home right the second is it it this is a game and games you learn to play a game well by playing it <laughs> you know and having an adventure means that you can if you play the adventure it has all it should have all the rules and some of the monsters new monsters and all that and you can see them in action also this is how it really works when they attack my keep or when I attack a foreign keep or I, I i talk to an ambassador or i use this new magical item ah this is how it works and nothing else even if you buy this book it's like yeah i'm not gonna use any of the rules you still have an adventure you can run with your 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 party even when you don't use, don't use any of the rules or use it just once and that's it as a one shot. So it's not a total loss. And for twenty dollars, I think that's pretty good. Now, the quality of adventure depends on. I think it's a good adventure myself. I what I read. I don't want to spoil it, uh, but I do like it. But I would say that that depends on your party as well. And that like again, let's go back to this little bit. Player engagement is a major story of faction warfare and political maneuvering that ultimately bestows upon the PCs a noble title and their own stronghold. Not all players care about this stuff. For your sake and theirs, talk to the players and get a sense of how interested they are in a campaign that involves politics, intrigue, commanding armies, maintaining a keep or castle. As long as some of them are interested in this, you're good to go. So I think this is... This is a rundown. I don't want to go into everything specifically. Again, nice art. Uh -huh. um, 
But this is a rundown on what it is. Now, the good points. I like the fact that there is a book that covers strongholds. I like the fact that the rules are simple and to the point. They're flexible. I like Matt Coble's authorial voice. He speaks, you know, jovial and, and sort of down to earth. Makes it easy to understand. He is, the book is well annotated. Um, and it has an adventure in it. So that if you want to try, in fact, the cool thing is that if you want to try the book out, it's like, oh, I want to do a one shot. <laughs> yeah. If you want to run a one shot, right? And have the players try it out and they like it here it has an built-in adventure usually uh the the uh, the there's no real guilt here although you can have a front uh the establishment is more to gather information literally to, it's a spy ring it's a center of spy ring so anybody could do it right but usually rogues and bards will do that right and it could be a front for the guild that the the rogue is running right just like you know the keep could be uh, the you know the center of the army that the the fighter is is in charge of the general of. I apologize for that. There must be some alarm somewhere. Um, so those are the good things. The bad things. Some editorial um, decisions, sort of not putting everything under one heading. Um, at times, this book, and this is common to most source books, is a little bit wishy washy. In that, well, you could use this rule, but we're not going to really tell you to use the rules. Like, no, 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 no. Well, that's all part of the... This is the thing about the rule set here. It's simple. It's all part of... Once, if you maintain the stronghold, the stronghold gives you the benefits, and that's it. You don't have to nickel and dime specific characters like, oh... You know, five chillings for the, the kid in front of the store who's a lookout. You know, 15 chillings for... It doesn't work that way, right? Uh, so this is this this actually simplifies a lot of things. And I, I, if you're interested in running a, a city campaign, the establishment, I think, it would be a pretty cool thing, right? It has those things. We have, it's not simply a matter of having a castle on that set. Um, the, I was going back to the point. Uh, the authorial... Um, Voice is like, well, you know, and I understand why they do it, but I would have preferred like, okay, these are the rules, but if you want to do something different, and the book does have examples of that, here are the, here are the examples of things you can do with this, right? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what the rules are according to what I want, and this is what are my intent, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever, how many, one rule of three or whatever, and these are some of the options, or none of the above, do whatever you want. But don't go like, well, you know, you you bought this book, so you could use it, but uh, not really, because eh, it's like, dude, yeah, I bought the book. I want to use it. That's for few, my, if Mr. Koval ever watches this video, I want to put it also on my YouTube channel. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I mean, right? It's like, yeah, you know, I, I know why you did it. I've done it myself. Every GM on the planet does it at some point. And the ones I actually try to understand and try to convince the players as opposed to just steamroll them. But, you know. And finally, uh, the fact that this book feels at some points as it's half a book. Like Hurricane Hugo made it. Yeah, it's following the same tone, but that's that predates five eight. It's a, it's a thing. It's about it's all, it's part of role playing, right? It's part of the conversation. You wanna have people agree with you rather than go like do the thing. Like, well, I don't wanna do it. Do the thing. But do it. Do it. Do it. You're like, all right, I'm going to do it. And then people just get angry and all that. So you don't want angry players. You want happy players. And so you kind of you softball them. Which is fine. But still, you know, there are ways and there's ways. But like I was saying, and Hurricane Hugo brought it back, is like, it feels like although it has warfare rules in the book, let's be fair, simple, straightforward rules, including units and all that, so they're, they're pretty complete, simple but complete. It still feels like this is like a half a book at points. Like, oh, maybe I should wait to Kingdoms and Warfare to really get the most out of my stronghold or my whatever, especially if you're playing the classical castle stronghold. I can understand why that happened. Editorial 
concerns. And, you know, there's a, comes a point where you're going to say, do we release a book or not? Do we wait to have all this information and charge $40 for it? Or we can release a book right now, especially one that's being crowdfunded right now that we made a promise we're going to do in this amount of time. Right? Or not. It also raises a specter of, again, the splat book. And I'm going to give you, and again, Mr. Koval ever watches this. Mr. Koval, I'm going to say this very clearly. This is not a direct comparison. Because for I to make a direct comparison between yourself and this individual and this company. Exactly. Uh, and it's a small company, uh, by the way. You would be within your rights to reach over to your phone or method of instant or fast communication, contact your lawyer and sue me for defamation. I understand this, so I'm not making a direct comparison. I'm just putting the worst case scenario. So brace yourself, chat. And some many people maybe know about what I'm talking about. I may even get angry because I'm referring this about this person for many reasons, but hey, it's the truth. So here we go. I'm not going to mention the name of the company. I'm not going to mention the name of the individual uh, or the system involved. Well, the only clue I'm going to give is the following. The company was, last time I heard, was stationed, I believe, in Michigan, particularly, I think, in Point Gross Point, Michigan. No, either, no, either, no. And I think it was Ann Arbor or Point Gross. You know, those two, you know, satellite cities, satellite towns to Detroit. The, the nice, you know, rich parts of, the, of Michigan. Right. It's the 1980s. This company makes a lot of very interesting books. One of them have to do with perhaps one of the most famous one lines that they had had to do with turtles in a half shell. And I'm saying a bit too much with that one. And but eventually they say, oh, wait a minute. Everybody's doing spot books. Everybody's doing, you know, we're essentially a book publisher because that's what, you know, Game design companies are book publishers. They're just specialty, specialty book publishers. So they sell a lot of books. I can sell one book, a lot of one book, or I can have a lot of titles and each one sells on average. The Splat book is based on that second theory of having a lot of titles. The more titles you have, the more chances you to make money. You have a, a smaller audience, but the smaller audience buys more books, right? Five players instead of one buy. Instead of the GM, being the person who buys all the books, it's the GM and the other four players, or five or six or seven, whatever have you in the table. Right. The books would start always with this following. Hey, listen, this book, this great book that you have in your hands, has all the stuff that we couldn't put in the other book. So congratulations, you have this book that, you know, has all the rules that we couldn't the creatures, the 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 technology and the special powers and abilities. I'm giving another hint of what, what I'm talking about. And uh, stuff like that. So it was great. Hey, you have this great book. But it turns out that we couldn't put all the stuff that we wanted to put in this book. Well, in this book. Which means if you want to have all the stuff that we want to put in this book, you're going to have to get this other book. And that's why a lot of people got very, very angry. It took dec it nearly took a decade. Because this stuff started about 1985 and didn't really slow down until 2005 or 2006 with the explosion that was 3rd edition OGL and actually ended up hurting Wars of the Coast and then the Dungeons and Dragons brand, Pathfinder, a very example. But then the Pathfinder doesn't do this for the most part. So I'm not saying that that's the company. So don't reach for your phones. You don't have to call your lawyers. But they would do that, right? And even then, you know, Mr. Colville is aware of this. He puts his kind of bogus to do this. So if you want just have a cool uh, setup for, like I was saying, oh, hey, I just want simple rules to establish strongholds, to get my party to do that. Maybe you want them to give them as, as rewards, as a, this book implies. Then they was this for you. It has great examples and some cool ideas like the Barbarian Camp, which is always in the move, the Pirate Ship. You know, has uh, cool rules for uh, improving your your uh, your spells, existing spells, and cool NPCs. Has a built-in adventure in it. It's well worth the price there. If you were thinking, no, well, maybe 
I, this stuff about seasons and provinces and, and maybe hexes, because that seems like a hex scroll thing, then I would say wait until Kingdoms and Warfare comes out and either buy that book or buy these two books together. Hopefully by that time this book will be discounted, so or maybe in a bundle. I would say that I'm happy with what I bought this book. Um, I'm very happy with it uh, for what it is. But I am also looking forward to Kingdoms and Warfare, giving that a look and seeing if it actually complements and fills in this book. If it does, if it turns out to be sort of a PHB, that is player handbook slash dungeon master guide kind of complement where, you know, you have the rules for players and playing the game. And then this other book gives you sort of the inside look and the optional rules and all that kind of, you know, book ends kind of situation. I would say, okay, fine. Because this book is it's a good standalone. It does what it's supposed to do. But it does have things that could be expanded upon later on, like the warfare rules. It has warfare rules, but it's not the full set. And I can understand the decisions why. If you really are keen on those political and warfare rules, then I think you have to go to Kingdoms and Warfare and either buy that book or buy these two books together. So uh, overall, that's my, it's a, overall a good book. I liked it. Uh, I think I, I'll, I'll give it a try. I really want to give it a try with a group. I have it, This actually fits very well with some ideas I've had for some time uh, to run my game. Uh, my suggestion to do is that this is, although the book is marketed as a book for players, all the players, this is really a GM book. This is a GM source book book, at least in my, from my experience, in my view, uh, and should be introduced not in an ongoing campaign, but rather, unless you just, you know, you just want to use the lift the rules for the the keep, for example. Like, oh, you want a stronghold? Okay, these are the rules, and and go from there, and that's it. You want to use the piecemeal, but if you want to use the entire thing, I would say introduce it from the get go. Talk to your players, have that conversation, or if a player brings you the book, say, hey, I got this book, and you want to talk about it, okay, and introduce it into your um, into your campaign. Specifically, if you're thinking and having that transition from the dungeon to the keep. So that's all I have to say on this. I'd like to thank Hurricane Hugo and everyone else who joined us. Uh, you can find this book at the uh, at their website. Uh, uh, the company name is uh, the, the MCDM. Uh, you can find, by the way, I bought this book. I should have said that in the very beginning. I bought this book, $20 from their store. This was not a gift. This was not uh, given to me for review. I bought the book and I have it and I made the review based on that fact. Someone else reviews it. I'll make it very, very simple. So that's gorgeous art. So I love the art. So my recommendation is buy it if, you, if this is what you want to do. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, it's Christmas Eve. I hope everybody has a great Christmas Eve. I may do a stream tonight. Maybe, may not, depending on how I'm feeling, you know, dinner and all that. If I do, it's probably going to be Saints Row 4, just having that Christmas pack. And we will continue, not tomorrow, because tomorrow is Christmas and even I need a break, but on Thursday with more battle tech. And then next year, we'll talk looking at, and probably uh, end of the year program, where we'll I talk about the state of the channel, etc. If you want to support this channel, if you like what we do here, uh, you can do many ways. You can join the chat, you can subscribe, you can follow, you can cheer. Uh, cheering charity cheer is still open all to uh, to the 29th of this month and you can join the discord uh, like so where we talk all kinds of games including game design and you can join us there so thank you Hugo uh, Hurricane Hugo thank you everybody for joining uh, and we will post this on the YouTube channel on the lessons learned and we'll see you when we see you bye